morning. And I just want to see if I can see everybody here. So I suspect we are going to have a quiet morning because it is, after all, Mother's Day. And many people are out playing their first round of golf or connecting with their families, having breakfast. So for those of the, you that have chosen to make us part of your special day, welcome. We are so glad to celebrate this day with you. And you will notice that I was doing, trying to do the slow spin. We're still working with the very limited internet connection here at the church. It is improved, but it's not perfect yet. So we are using one or two devices only. If anybody in the sanctuary has a device that's on and using Wi-Fi, turn your Wi-Fi off, please. I need to, we need all the Wi-Fi for the church devices so that we can um, appreciate different parts of the service, such as our um, interview with Alice Pepper that was conducted by Meg Phillips and myself, as well as the choral performance a cappella, mind you, of canon, both of which will be shared virtually and everyone will be able to hear them. Um, but we're hoping the people in the church will get to fully appreciate them because we have a good signal. And may the signal from God be all strong and almighty and all powerful and ever clear to all of us. Just a quick reminder that again, May 22nd, I believe rain or shine at this point, we've decided is our plant sale here at the church. You can get in touch with, who do they get in touch with? Um, Linda? Meg or Kit or Linda, I believe, if you have questions or want to offer anything for the sale. Otherwise, just show up on a beautiful day, rain or shine, it will be beautiful. And we will enjoy gathering and celebrating the earth and the spring. Are there any other announcements for the life of the church that anyone needs to make? If you do, please unmute so that you can share them. And can everybody hear me all right? Is the audio okay? Okay, great. Always got to check that. So we have Billy with us. I think we've got Billy with us. I'm pretty sure I saw him. Yeah, Billy, you're here. So Billy, I thought, I don't know what your plans are with your family, but just in case, would you like to introduce the song now or do you want to wait until later? Okay, just unmute yourself. Can't hear you, Billy. Billy's our choir director for anybody that hasn't figured that out yet. I, I kind of surprised him. Okay, he's going to wait till it's presented. Um, at, after the interview with Alice and Meg, he'll introduce the song at that time. Then we like to begin our worship by centering ourselves with some music. So please close your eyes, put your feet firmly on the floor, open your bodies, open your hands and receive the gift of music and come into the presence of God.
and we give thanks for Alan's gift of music, and especially the fact that he can so spontaneously lead us in music, as well as his gift and Billy's gift for composition and their own original music. The Battenfelder family is with us this morning, and they are going to lead us in a few parts of the service. So we're going to be doing a call to worship. If you're here in the sanctuary, have a bulletin, and you should be able to follow along with that call to worship. I'll read the leader part, and the Battenfelders will lead us in people's response. So please just follow waiting. along, and it, if you're in Zoom, it will be up on the screen. We're going to read the people first. This is adapted from a liturgy that was prepared by the Reverend Carol Penner. And Jesus said, come. To all mothers and all children, he, he said, said come. come. To the motherless and the childless, he said, come. To, to all who long to be mothered, mothered he said, come. Love invited, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Love, Love offered, and I, I will give you rest. rest. Love suggested, take my yoke upon you. Love, Love whispered, and learned learn from me. Love promised, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Thank you to our Battenfelder family for their leadership. They will be sharing with us a couple other parts of this service. We will begin today's celebration of Mother's Day with first a quick note on the origins of Mother's Day and then the Battenfelders will lead us, you will listen to a Mother's Day prayer. But I want to make note of the roots of Mother's Day because it is a cry for peace. After the Civil War, there were soldiers buried, Union soldiers buried in Confederate fields and lands. There were Confederate soldiers buried in the North in the Union fields and lands. Sometimes people knew where their children were buried. Sometimes the children were unknown. Sometimes the families could make the journey to the place where a child had been laid to rest, but so often they could not. And so, the mothers of the enemy cared for not just the burial plots of their own children, but they became the parents of the children that had fallen in war, even for other families across enemy lines. And out of this experience that mothers were tending each other's children's graves. They could see that there was so much that they held in common and that they should not celebrate the terrible toll that division had taken upon this nation, but rather they should find that common ground and ask for a peace that was enduring and that one way of continually remembering and honoring and working toward peace was to say that we will set aside a day every year where the women of this nation will pray for each other's children and no family will extol the virtue of violence over peace. And even those today who have chosen military service do so in the hope of bringing peace. Peace is the highest virtue of this day. Julia Ward Howe first asked in 1870 for it to be a day set aside. And indeed, it has been set aside. And yes, we call our mothers, we send out cards, we celebrate with brunch and flowers and family gatherings. But let us remember that at the heart of this day is a 
request for peace and for us to be in communion and community. Let us also acknowledge that on a day like this, sometimes we're called to binaries. We're separated as men or women, as parent or not parent, but this day is so much more than that. And so let us remember that this day should not be diminished by turning it into an either or. Let us acknowledge it as a both end where we celebrate the personhood of those who one way or another have become parents to children, become mentors and coaches and those who shape their lives. When you listen to this prayer, imagine all the people that have touched your life, men and women, people who identify as either, and hold with esteem those who have changed you and helped you become the whole person that you are capable of being. And so if the Battenfelders would now read for us the Mother's Day prayer, I ask all of you to again, put your feet firmly on the floor and receive the gift of this prayer. Loving and creating God, we give thanks today for mothers. We give thanks for all women, who the, for those who identify as women, and for the people who live within a rich and wondrous spectrum of gender identities. Thank you for mothers who gave birth to us, adopted us, fostered us, blended their lives with ours, loved us, chose us, raised us. Thank you for women who have treated us as their own children and modeled for us how to be adults and whole human beings. Thank you for kindred. Thank God for spiritual mothers, godmothers. Thank you for matriarchs, ancestresses, godmothers, aunts, cousins, siblings, daughters, nieces, and descendants. Thank you for the women who mentored us, taught us, coached us, befriended us. Thank you for those who gave us sisterhood, deep bonds, kinship, and belonging of all kinds. You teach us how to be holistic parents, cherishing and protecting children among us. Help us mother and parent lovingly, fairly, wisely, and with great joy. Help us raise our children to be the people they are born to be. We need your comfort here today, God, because some are missing mothers, some are missing children, some are parted by distance or death. Comfort those who have given up their child for adoption or chose not to give birth. Comfort those who long to be biological mothers and could not. We pray here for those whose mothers have disappointed them. We ask for grace in relationships where there's pain and bitterness, for healing in relationships where there is abuse and violence. Help our community be a gathering wherein people can feel mothered, their gifts and talents appreciated and nurtured. Finally, we pray today for mothers around the world, mothers who cannot feed their children, mothers who are homeless or without a homeland, mothers who must teach their children about the dangers of bombs and bullets, Help us create a world where mothers can raise their children in peace and plenty. Help us love our planet and cosmos, Mother Earth, so she may continue to sustain us. God of mothers who created mothers, who came as a child and had a mother. God, our mother, love us with a sweeter and deeper love than we have ever known. And hear our prayer this day and give us the courage to be loved by you. Amen. Thank you, Kate, for that beautiful reading. As this is the time for prayer, we, as ever, lift up first those concerns that have been shared with us and any concerns that you may bring aloud to this group of people, whether you are here in the sanctuary or whether we are gathered in Zoom. I want first to name a few prayer concerns that have been brought to our attention, and then I will invite your additions. We start with prayers of concern. We ask for prayers for expectant mothers, for babies and children at risk. We pray for those who are living through the uncertainty of awaiting test results or diagnostics that will give answers and clarity to what may come next in their lives. We pray for Scamp and Huntley 
John and Nancy, Bill, Richard, Barry and Jan, Sasha. We pray for so many and we will again pray that prayer that is born out of 1 Corinthians about our bodies. But first we ask for those prayers that you gathered here today may lift up. If there's anyone in the sanctuary who has a prayer, we have a microphone here. You can raise your hand if there's anything you want to say out loud and we will share the microphone with you. Is there anyone who has a prayer of concern here in the sanctuary? Okay, Sue's going to share a prayer with us. Let us pray for our friend Kevin that he will have good days ahead. Thank you, Sue. And Kevin is gathered here with us. Other prayers in the sanctuary. Then if anyone in Zoom has a prayer of concern they wish to raise up out loud, I'm going to ask you to unmute. We're going to start with Kevin. Kevin is with us this morning. Go ahead, Kevin, but you need to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Kevin. Go for it. I want to pray for Reverend Gail and Chris, for our church, um, <clears throat> for the hospital staff and the hospital patients and the people who are coming into the hospital that don't belong to the hospital. I'm praying for them and prayer for me that my mental health and my physical health will improve and that my life will get straightened out or I'll be able to straighten out and deal with whatever I got to deal with and that God will be with me and in me and protecting me. And for the first responders and military, and um, I miss you all. Thank you, Kevin. We are with you. Um, Tom and Cheryl are unmuted. Do you wish to say a prayer? Uh, yes, continued prayers for Judy Schumann, who uh, remains hospitalized and um, uh, if people want to send cards, I, I'm sure they would appreciate it. So, she may... so, <laughs> and the family weighed in on that one. That's fine. <laughs> we, have, we have extra special family members with us every day. Other prayers of concern, you are welcome to unmute if you're in Zoom and you wish to share any prayers of concern. We will also be doing prayers of celebration. All right, well then, let's move to any prayers of celebration and then we'll do the body prayer. So anybody in the sanctuary that has a prayer of celebration they wish to say out loud. <laughs> Sue's got a celebration for us. <laughs> the very first hummingbirds at my theaters and they were there within two minutes after I put them up. They are back. Yeah, it's like watching an aerial combat sometimes. It's very exciting. Um, other prayers of celebration. I'm sure somebody's seen some kind of wonderful baby animal that they want to tell us all about. So if you're in Zoom and you have something to celebrate, pre please unmute and share it with us. We would love to hear. Meg, go for it. Um, I just want to say this is a National Nursing Home Week starting today. And I want to mm -hmm. celebrate all the people who care for our families. Yeah, are the people who have been family to our families when we couldn't get to them, um, the tremendous presence of people who have loved our kindred and our friends through COVID for so long, um, and in hospice, in hospitals, in retreats, in so many different places, we give thanks for those caregivers, as well as those who are resident in such places, um, and hopefully our capacity to, re to visit them. Other celebrations, um, Alan's got one now. <laughs> Alan's going out of order. He's in the sanctuary and now he's raised his hand. So we're gonna, yeah, we, we, yeah. go ahead. Just tell me what it is. Graduates, ah, oh, we have gra uh, college and high school graduations coming up. And so um, just an acknowledgement that this is the season of milestones and thresholds for our young people. And 
celebration for those moments. And Dan, go for it. Well, I, I want to thank everyone for their continued prayers. And I want to tell you that Barry's getting stronger all the time and more independent. And in fact, um, we've gone out to dinner several times, but last uh, Thursday, he went by himself. Well, I drove him there, but he went through CVS by himself and got me my Mother's Day card and paid for it and everything and didn't knock over anything with his very large world share. <laughs> so that was a celebration. It's a lovely card. I got it this morning, but uh, we be, we're taking, you know, slivers of progress, but we're making it. Thank you all for your prayers again. That's wonderful. So for Barry's, the moments of independence for Barry, um, I should say, we should need, we need to con have continued prayers of healing for Terry, Jean's daughter, Terry, who is recovering from a dog bite. Um, we, we, she's doing well, you say? Okay, good. But we like to hear that, but nevertheless, prayers for ongoing healing and prayers for calmer dogs. I have a prayer. Please go for it, Arden. Um, it's, well, it's not really prayer. It's a, it's a grateful prayer. Uh, yeah. Ray, took, Ray took a bad fall on Thursday and, uh, he, um, was, was bleeding all over and it, it, it hit his, above his eye, um, luckily not his eye. Um, I realized he's going to have to have stitches, took him to the hospital. They took a brain scan and there's no bleeding in the brain and the healing is very well on its way already. So I'm grateful for that. We're grateful for the- For the good outcome. <laughs> good outcome of a bad moment. Um, yeah. So prayer, prayers for stitches and emergency yeah. room people and for Ray's ongoing well-being. Any, hey, Battenfelders, do you have anything happy to share, like any cool animal sightings that, you're, that, you, that you can report on? Dogs. Dogs, all right. Dogs, I like it. Thank you, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I figured you guys are, have keen eyes. <laughs> I saw a fox, twice. Oh, a fox? Yep, twice. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yes, you think too. And right Kevin, when on the river. It was beautiful. And Kevin's waving. Go ahead, Kevin, unmute yourself and share your, your gratitudes. Um, I'm grateful for kind words, for sincere love, for hawks and eagles, for the Native American warriors. Thank you. I love kind words and sincere love. Ginger, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah. We saw a fisher cat up by Bretton Woods running through the parking lot. Okay, fisher cat. All right. This is a, okay. We're starting to accumulate now a good list foxes, hawks, and eagles, fisher cat, hummingbirds, bears, bear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wendy's raising her hand, bears. <laughs> And a blue jay, bluebird, a bluebird, and an indigo bunting, and Jean's got one. Three, three baby robins in a nest. So a lot of birds that are bringing some joy to all of us. Thank you for the ways that you lift each other up and that you hold each other up. Please take your hands, place them somewhere on your body that you know that you or someone you love needs prayer, and let us together revisit the words of Genesis and 1 Corinthians. Creator, Christ, and Comforter, as we are told in Genesis, all of humankind, each of us, was made in your image and in your likeness. Today we lift up the children, all children of you in prayer, in concern and celebration. This morning we place into your keeping the parts of our bodies which are your bodies that need healing and hope, comfort and dignity, love and renewal. 
You gave birth to the whole world, so we also ask for your attention and compassionate presence for the vulnerable places in your creation. India, Zimbabwe, Honduras, so many parts of the world, some particularly special to us. And as we remember in 1 Corinthians, we acknowledge with gratitude that you have shared with us, your children, an outpouring of gifts from the Holy Spirit. It's the same spirit that binds us together so that when one of us cries out, you cry out. And when one of us celebrates, you sing along with us. You remind us as we gather as your people to understand our lives together by looking at our own bodies, our human bodies, because each body is made up of many parts, limbs, organs, cells, yet all our members living in one gathered body. And it's the same when we who are so many and so different come together as distinctive parts of Christ's resurrection body that is all of us made stronger by our shared diversity unified by belonging to god's self and knitted together by that holy spirit you have called each of us beloved today let us learn anew what it means to live as members of your human and your holy body every part dependent on every other part the parts we mention and the parts we don't, the parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. And if one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. You and me gathered here in this place and all across Zoom and all over the world, brothers and sisters, we, we are Christ's broken, open, renewed resurrection body. We are bigger and we are more every day that we are gathered because we are gathered with a love that overflows and connects us and transforms us. We need each other and we depend on each other. And when we pray over one individual body or one part of the body, we are praying for each other and all of us together. We are praying for the hurting and the healing, the living and the dying and the resurrected body of Christ that belongs to you and to me, to each other, loving each other in this world and the next. We ask that you will hold the parts of the body that we have held and touched with your mercy and your tenderness and your love. We give thanks for you, amen. And we gather ourselves together, please unmute if you will, by saying together the Lord's Prayer, which you can find either in your bulletin or up on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth and in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Give us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, in the glory forever. Amen. We chose for you this morning a wonderful reading from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, which the Battenfelders will share for us. But just note, at this wedding, Christ has not yet begun his public ministry. He's there with his family. But he isn't ready to reveal himself or to fully know what comes next. And yet his mother asks of him that he shall transform water into wine and reveal himself. And because a mother asks, the son responds. And the ministry that has become the model for all of us of the great love commences. 
On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it had, come, had came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. And after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers and his disciples and they remained there a few days. Thank you again uh, to Kate, Kala, and Edie for their leadership this morning and for spending part of their Mother's Day with all of us. As a special treat for all of you, we share with you this morning an interview conducted by Meg and I with Alice Pepper just last week. They, these are highlights. We had a lovely conversation with many amazing stories and what we should probably do like some outtakes from it later for you, but let this be a wonderful ensemble of, of the things that Alice shared with all of us. Gail and I are here today to talk with our beloved church member, Alice Pepper. Um, Alice is probably one of the older members of our church and we're curious to see what your experiences have been in your life here in Jackson. Uh, um, Alice has a long history of living in Jackson, sometimes part-time, sometimes full-time. Right. Um, and I'm always amazed at the conversations we'll have where she intersperses some things she did in her past, like playing the piano and the organ at church, things like that. So anyway, this is Alice Pepper, and we're here to talk this morning. Awesome. And we're doing this in honor of Mother's Day, right? So part of this is that we're recognizing Alice as a matriarch of our church and of our community and just... Right, so, well, why don't we launch into to motherhood then? Because that's one of the topics of right. today. And for you, that's, that's a very complicated uh, experience at this point. The, wide, the widest scattered family you can imagine. <laughs> Tell yes. us about your family. My son lives in Seattle and comes. You tries to come to Jackson once or twice a year. Okay. Sarah spends half her time here, she has a house in Jackson, but also spends close to half a year in Sweden where she is very interested in Swedish folk music and her husband is Swedish and has family there. Mm -hmm. So that's where she was stuck for the pandemic because they were, and the grandchildren are even father scattered. Uh, uh, yeah, tell us what they're up to. Uh, my son has two boys who are, one is, he's a wine expert. Mm -hmm. He moved to a new restaurant in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And his other son teaches English in Taiwan. Yeah, he does. See, Sarah's has a, the oldest one is an architect in Denver. Gibbs is working for a PhD in art history at the City University of New York. Bridget runs a bar, assistant manager of a restaurant in Washington, D.C. And Rowan just got a job as a in a bake as a baker in a bakery in Brooklyn. So they were all over. <laughs> and I remember when they were tiny and my Sarah used to babysit for them. <laughs> so right. like, the kids they, you think they look for your motherly well, attitude I, I think, about I think all. perhaps it was the other way around. I looked to them for guidance and oh, how okay. to treat the situation. Yeah. I think that you have to be sort of ready to go with the you know, go with the flow, go with they, they 
but it sounds like you love and accept every one of your grandchildren and whatever path they oh, yes. find through the world. So talk, can we you say a little bit more about Eric? Because Eric um, is your child who died. Yes, he, he, was, it, he was a terrible shock because he died in an accident. Yes. He fell downstairs. Yeah. Be very, I mean, so we miss him just day by day. Yeah, of course yeah. you do. He was your, your steady rock in Jackson. He was your one, right? The one Jackson child, yeah. huh? Yeah. The one that stayed here. Yeah. And so, what if you were going to talk to other families, other parents about what has given you strength um, through experiences like Eric's death or Brian's diagnosis? You know, I mean, if you can break your heart to be a parent or a grandparent, what what gives you strength? each other. I'm very fortunate to have a supportive husband. And this was your family's home? This was my grandparents built this house wow. in, in 1902. So your, your family has long roots here? My, yes. My, grand, my mother was born here. My, in this house, my grandparents were both born here. And their parents were... My grandmother's goes to several generations. Wow. But it sounds as though somewhere in you or your parents was instilled that wanderlust that you've all been adventurers. <laughs> right. so. I suppose. Yeah. My father was a Baptist minister. We moved around mostly in Boston suburbs. To, to go from church to church? Um, yes. Okay. If you were going to reflect on, since we're talking about your father being a minister, how has faith been part of your journey? I enjoyed being in church. Mm -hmm. I miss the atmosphere of being in church and singing hymns. Sure. And right. That sort of thing. So for you, music is really a huge part of. Very important. What's important? And, and I like, and I, I'm fussy about my music too. Oh, I, I'm, yeah. I'm a classical music fan, so I like yeah. hymns that come from classical music. Okay. Can you think of a few that are your favorites? Oh, this one is done, done on Beethoven's Ninth Symphony right now. Okay. Joyful, joyful, we adore Oh, oh yeah, that's one of my so. favorites, too. Uh, and you, you play music, right? You're a pianist. Yes. In fact, when I, I don't play, but I had a stroke about six years ago. So mm -hmm. my left hand is not as cooperative as it used to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I play for myself, but not for other people anymore. Mm -hmm. But I, when I was living in Jackson the first time, when the kids were small, I played. I actually played the organ one winter in the church. Oh wow! Is I think I got paid at least the first time. I got, <laughs> I got paid a dollar a week. <laughs> oh, that 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 yeah. Then I got a dollar to play the organ, so I was wealthy. She was really. It's hard. It was hard to find summer jobs, except for housekeeping and waitressing, probably. So right. you you had some good jobs. But uh, fortunately, college was not expensive that day, so I didn't need to earn heaps of money to go to cop for college. And where, did, where right. did you go to college? I, I tell people now I went to Harvard, but it was Radcliffe then. Yeah. <laughs> because all, all our classes were conducted by Harvard professors. Mm -hmm. Did you have separate classes from the boys in school then? For freshmen, but at, no, no, upper classes were almost all together. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the professor would only have to teach one class. Yeah. But you, did, but you weren't getting a Harvard degree, right? The, the well, we boys would get the Harvard degree and you got the Harvard degree. signed by the Harvard president. Isn't that funny? Well. Uh, Actually, so I, I was a mathematics major, so I understand math and all that stuff. Sure. When, when I worked at MIT when the computer was a whole room. Wow. Right. So and what did uh, you do when you worked at MIT? I was a research assistant in mathematics. I wrote, solved equations, you, you, had to, you give an equation, you had to do it with a calculator, seven digits, and then I worked, I did that for about a year, and then I worked research assistant, I basically, what you can call it. So I was married the first time and moved to Jackson. Mm -hmm. About the same time I had the first child, so. So, and were you the first generation to go to Harvard, or was that part of your family? No, my father did, and my, my brother did, my father did, and my grandfather went. He I have a long history of people, women going to college. Okay. My grandmother, Wood, my mother, father's mother, was in the first women's college at Brown University. Wow. And uh, my great grandmother went to the University of Chicago. Yes, she, she, she graduated in 1872. Wow. So, and how, um, 
how has that heritage of, of, of education that ended up translating into the younger generations of your family? Well, all my, uh, all my grandchildren are graduating from college. You just exude a very positive outlook on, every, on everything about life. Yes. That many right. things have happened, the kids are scattered everywhere, the grandchildren <laughs> are scattered everywhere, but you seem to take a lot of well, this, joy this, in that and yes. just bring it all into yourself, it looks like to me. Life lessons. What did you learn from the women in your life? Both of my grandmothers were hard workers in very different ways. I mean, my, my grandmother, Ferno, my mother's mother, ran a boarding house here. It was very busy in the summer. So they worked at Wentworth Hall to earn enough money to buy the farm and to build it and to live by the build of the buildings. So that, they were married in 1893 and were 19 Two, they moved, build a, finished building the house. So my grandmother, my mother's father's mother, was a college professor. Oh wow! Taught English, <laughs> or they call it rhetoric then. Rhetoric. And where did she teach? Where did she teach? Well, they college? they ran a, a religious college in in Boston. You may have heard of Gordon College. Yes, oh, sure. absolutely. Yes. And okay, so so your grandmothers both went were hardworking women. Um, so that's one of the things that you clearly carried on because and, you, know, um, you worked your way through. You wrote a history of Jackson, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I got started. I, um, I, I did a number. Of, I was. I taught school up here for a couple of years. It wasn't much else I could do to, mm -hmm. to, to live in to live in Jackson. I, it's part of the. After John and I were married, I didn't go back to teaching school. So I got into. I, I got interested in genealogy, researching family history. Half the genealogy was based in Jackson. That's how I got started in Jackson, it's because the family was all in Jackson. And so the family stories became, in a way, the story of Jackson itself, or right. part of the story of Jackson. Yes, because one of my grandmother's, two of my grandmother's ancestors, one of them uh, was here in 1800, and my another of her ancestors was, was the first minister in Jackson, okay. Daniel Elkins. Uh, he was here when the church was out. He was minister when the church was out here on the corner. At the triangle. Right, yeah. the historic yeah. triangle. Yeah. And I started to out other families mm -hmm. that have been more of a part of Jackson history. Sure. I wrote a book about the oldest houses in Jackson mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I found a map in, printed, published in 1860 that mm -hmm. had all the houses by and the people's names who was living here in 1860. Wow. So I went around and figured which houses were still there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, exploring your own family story and then exploring the stories of Jackson, what would you share about that, that the journey of telling those stories? I don't know. It was something I got very interested in. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to have something to show for what I do. Sure. I, could, I mean, there's some things I might have done differently, but it came out pretty well. Yeah. So you've probably passed some of that following your passion kind of uh, feeling onto, onto your children and grandchildren. They all seem to be pursuing things that much maybe right. don't match them. So skiing is something that your family has continued to have passion for. Well, I have a picture of my mother skiing in about 1916, oh, I think. Yeah. I, I think because we lived in, because, because we lived in Jackson. Oh, you go to, where else do you go to school and, and you go skiing for one afternoon a week in school? For sure. Right. It's part of, it's just integral to life here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you've been a passionate, pretty high level skier yourself. Well, in the ma we did the Masters racing for weekends for, after John retired for several years. So I know you're proud of your daffodils out here, but is gardening one of your big passions? Oh, it is. Although John planted the daffodils. I've been interested in gardening. I had, when I was here, with, I started having gardens here. When I was here with small children, they could play outside and I could work in the garden. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, they had difficult fitting it all in. <laughs> yeah. That was a mixture of flowers and vegetables. Uh, I like ones that I can cut and bring in the house. So like a cut and you still maintain a cutting garden now or not? Yes, something said. But I have help gardening now. I can't do it myself. I have so, I, well, Sarah did it with me for a while. Mm -hmm. And then she got her so friend to help me. Mm -hmm. So, I, so she continues to come. That's lovely. Nice. Nice. She likes working. Yeah, 
So, you know, so again, that's something you know, like working in the garden is something that you've shared with your family and then other people become sort of extended family in different ways, right? right. And share those passions with you. Was gardening, when you, when you were here with young children um, living in Jackson, was that something that most um, women your age were doing? Is that kind of part of the... Uh, a lot of people were, a lot of women worked. Okay. I, we were, we were part of a babysitting arrangement. We had, uh, we had, we swapped. We'd have everybody all the whole, we almost like a kindergarten. You'd have all the kids here, and then they, and then they'd take your kids for, for a morning or two mornings a week. Yeah. And we did this so you could do gardening, or you could the window, so you could go skiing. Mm -hmm. okay. And so, and so that's a that's an important lesson for to learn, right, about self care. That's true. So you could, every could better get outside and have their own time to do things. Girlfriends, like, and what, what did you like to do with your your f women friends? Well, I had somebody went skiing with. Okay. We went, we'd go hiking in the summer. We took all the kids up Mount Washington, a lot of. So we we went up the Amanusa Trail. So we came back at Crawford dot dot, and we stopped at the Willie House where and there was a zoo. Where, a wild animal. Really? We went racing. We were, we were exhausted. They went racing around through the, the woods to go and get all the animals. As if they weren't tired at all anymore. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> but we did a lot of hiking. That was one of the one mm -hmm. I particularly remember. But. Yeah, I think hiking is also intrinsic to life here in this part. Yes. I know you've told me this story before, but can you tell us uh, again about meeting John? Well, we 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 met, we met skiing hmm. up here. Yeah, at Wildcat. Okay. So, what was um, it like to? Um, I mean, you know, now people would call it sort of like a blended family, where you know John became part of the family. Well, he doesn't have any children, so that makes it easier than some some blended families. Yes. So he just took over as their father. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and he surely loves them, right? You know, the fact that, as you said, that he calls them and well, takes oh, care yes. of them, and they're his children. But what what are the languages of love in your family? You know, like, how do you guys show or, or express love for each other? Maybe we don't express it in words. Yeah, well, and other, what, are, what are the other ways you express it, the nonverbal ways that you share it I just think doing things for each other I guess I can see I, I view one of the nonverbal ways when I walk by especially in the summer when these two are out eating their breakfast or their lunch at that beautifully set table on the porch yeah flowers in a vase in the middle and I think isn't that wonderful that you're sitting spending that kind of time Sometimes you're reading, but often just eating a meal, and I think that, to me, is love. I look at that, and I think... But you do absolutely glow, and your enthusiasm is so obvious when I meet you places, or you come to choir, or you get into things. Where do you get all that verve at your age, you know? I don't know. It's, I mean, so the I, smile is always there, too. Yeah, um, you're going to try to share or lessons that you've learned in your life. I'm not sure I've learned it. Big, big sweeping <laughs> questions. Yeah. Do you have any? Do you have any things that come to mind? <laughs> I guess you accept the the role you have and do the best you can with it. Well, you and you've had many different roles and paths that you've taken over time, right? Think your life probably didn't go the way you exactly expected it, and yet look at the life you now have. Right. I never expected to live so long. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. And what would you, so you didn't expect to live as long as you have lived. So what, what do you say about that now? I mean, what? Well, uh, I'm sorry about the things I can't do anymore. I, 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 and what would be examples of the things that you miss being able to do? Going out and hiking, mm -hmm. getting outside, and or playing tennis. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm playing golf. I have so you know those things you don't. So and I and giving up skiing. What have you found pleasure in, even as you're giving up things? What things are continuing to give you enjoyment? Well, reading. Reading. Uh, 
a little bit of gardening. I can't do the, most of the gardening, but I've started some seeds. I have tomato plants that are this high. <laughs> and I have a greenhouse upstairs off the bedroom. Oh, wow. So you found different ways to garden that you could let you continue to As long as somebody helps me do the rest of it, yes. Sure. But again, adapting and create being creative about it, yeah. And having having more hobbies, yeah. I hope. And and you mentioned that you, you still play piano yes. on the days, especially when your hand permits. Right. I mean, I'm, people still call them and ask me for to find their ancestors in Jackson. <laughs> really? Yeah. So you're, st a, you're still a genealogical resource. Yeah. So I still have And Warren sends them to me <laughs> and every, every time he gets a question. Or well, Alice can answer this. Yeah. Yeah. So I find you got people say they did. I, I, I don't have enough hours of the day. You don't? So you're still yeah. busy all day long? Yes. Any hopes for so the this year, next year? Well, I hope somebody, I hope the family gets here in the summertime. Mm -hmm. I think the vet bothers bothers most about not having a family visit. Sure, again. Yeah. Yeah. Have there been any other times in your life where you have had an experience that you feel parallels the experience of the pandemic? or? Was it well, once the fail I felt trapped in my life was being in Newfoundland. If you're on an island and you have to take a ferry to get off or an airplane, <laughs> you feel much more trapped than you do, say, play here where you can just get in a car and drive anywhere. Sure. Mm -hmm. So so you didn't feel so trapped here because you'd had an experience that gave you perspective about that even? Yeah, I guess so. You can mm -hmm. get up there too. Okay. And we are where we like to be. Yeah, right? right? I mean, you, this is where you choose to be if you had all the choices in the world, yeah? Right. I guess you accept the, the role you have and do the best you can with it. You have to be sort of ready to go with the, you know, go with the flow. And we are where we like to be. Again, those are just a few highlights. Um, you know, obviously this is a very Jackson-centric interview because this is a family that's a matriarch and patriarch here in Jackson. But I think we have a lot to learn uh, from Alice. We'll try to put up on the website more outros from the interview that are longer stories. She had a lot of really, really good stories. We could only give little snippets to you here this morning, but thanks also to Meg for helping to ask some really great questions. Again, we, we, we couldn't begin to share everything with you that was offered. We are now going to follow up that lovely experience with the acapella performance of Canon by the Jackson Community Church Choir, which will now be introduced first by Billy. So Billy, if you wanna try unmuting. Can you all hear me? Yes. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day. Um, so the choir for the past month, we've been working on this um, arrangement of Canon and D. It's actually a kind of a spinoff of Canon and D, Johan Pachelbel's Canon and D. Um, and the reason why we, I chose this song for Mother's Day is because whenever I think of uh, Canon and D or in general, just a song like Canon and D, I think of springtime, I think of happiness, and I just think of opportunities just blossoming um it, with the new season coming so i felt that this is a very fitting uh song for us to do for mother's day um this arrangement is by alan out uh, sorry alan billingsley and feel free to enjoy Boom. 
So uh, feel free to unmute and give our choir your full voiced, full throated support. That was wonderful, really wonderful. And I have heard how this was a very technically challenging uh, song for everybody. So it came out beautifully, Billy. And what a wonderful melding of all these great voices and I know the tenacity of people to prepare their parts and um, share them with all of us. Beautiful. Thank you, Billy. And uh, I just, I don't want to go any further without acknowledging that John Pepper had a birthday yesterday. So um, I don't know, should we unmute and sing happy birthday? We're really terrible at it. The people in the sanctuary are saying absolutely not. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're not gonna try to, we, we've had the beautiful choir. So John, that was our birthday song for you was the acapella choir. Then let us simply remember the commitment that we have made to each other. This is the time in the service when we remind you that part of the way that we take care of each other is through our giving and that you have all continued throughout this time to be very generous and consistent in your commitment and we appreciate it. If you are giving to us, you can go to jxncc.org. You can place your offering in an envelope. If you're here in the sanctuary, there's baskets and plates in either direction. And thank you as always for remembering and giving in this way, as well as so many others. We want to conclude the service today with Alice's favorite song, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. I am confident that most of you know it well enough that Alan will play it. We'll put the words up on the screen for you. You can remain muted and belt it out if you're at home. And if you're here in the sanctuary, hum it as loud as you would like to. Um, yeah, three verses. Uh, we put up words for four, but we're going to just do three verses for all of you.
notice that we snuck the word mother into the lyrics there, just in honor of the day. And now, again, we, we like to share these traditions that bind us together in, in our cultural, communal way. So we revisit, as ever, our benediction that is such a beloved part of this church's life. 